Cena Grace is taking the Brian Michael Bennis pipeline to DC Comics to join fellow writers G. Willow Wilson, Matt Fraction, Jody Hauser, and Kelly Sue DeConnick, among others. DC Comics November solicitations are in, and I gotta be honest, it doesn't look promising from my vantage point. I've been saying for a while now, DC is moving towards a publishing approach much closer to Marvel, and it really starts taking hold in November. Before I get to all the terrible details, I want to talk briefly about DC Comics' Green Lantern problem. Specifically, the enormous volume of Human Lanterns. Coming into November, the core features a total of seven Human Lanterns. Hal Jordan, Jon Stewart, Guy Gardner, Kyle Rayner, Jessica Cruz, who may actually be dead now, Simon Baz, and most recently, Bennis creation, Teen Lantern. That's at least four Human Lanterns too many. Now, I don't think DC should kill them off, but I'm not completely opposed to a culling of the Lanterns either. November introduces two new Human Lanterns to the fold. N.K. Jemisin, who? Good question. Makes her comic book debut with Young Animals Far Sector. Sojourner Joe Moline is one of the two newest Lanterns. I will give DC this. They have some stones. Artist Jamal Campbell exits the only breakout hit Brian Michael Bendis has since arriving at DC, they owe me to illustrate the 12-issue maxi-series from a writer who probably won't ever create another comic series again. Campbell's art is the only aspect of Naomi I personally find appealing. I'll be shocked if Far Sector eclipses 15,000 issues shipped after the second issue. So far, the cover is the only art previewed, and I can't even begin to understand who DC thinks is going to be excited by this generic trash. The other new Lantern is Ty Pham from the pages of the Green Lantern Legacy graphic novel from DC's Kids Line. Unfortunately, it appears writer Min Lee hasn't read up on the core. Ty Pham inherits the ring from his grandmother, which makes no sense given Green Lantern lore. Little Ty is also an aspiring artist, so I guess DC couldn't bother to tell Min Lee that angle was already explored with Kyle Rayner. But have no fear, it appears Ty Pham will be using his power ring to fight racist bullies in his neighborhood. Using a power ring to fight racist bullies seems a bit on the excessive side, but what do I know? November is also unique because it doesn't feature a single ongoing Green Lantern title. Grant Morrison and Liam Sharp's The Green Lantern ends at issue 12. Morrison's Green Lantern Black Stars three-part miniseries begins in November with Wonder Woman artist Zermonico. I don't know. Feels like the Green Lantern core characters have seen better days. But this is also very emblematic of the overall direction DC Comics is taking moving forward. Now let's dive into all the details of DC's November comic book solicitations. DC Comics are nearly doubling their slate of debut issues from October to November with count them, 13 big number ones. Brian Michael Bendis continues accumulating DC franchises with the release of Legion of Superheroes number one following his two-part Millennium story. Genlock number one looks and sounds straight out of Marvel comic solicitations. The villainous union has been steadily taking over more and more of the planet after initiating the global culture war. It also appears to heavily rip off Pacific Rim's premise. DC Black Label features the abuse of Hill House Comics' The Dollhouse Family and Sandman Universe's John Constantine Hellblazer. 13 new number one issues isn't quite Marvel territory yet, but DC is quickly moving in that direction. DC Comics is cutting their Batman-related titles back from 21 to 17 in November as they start putting more emphasis on debuts and Black Label. Still, 17 Batman titles blows the door off any other character in the industry, including Spider-Man. Six Batman comics have Year of the Villain tie-ins, including Detective Comics, Catwoman, Nightwing, Red Hood, and Batman and the Outsiders. City of Bane continues pushing towards the end of Tom King's run on the flagship Batman series. Issue 83 features a cover that indicates Batman finally turns the table on Nemesis Bane. Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's Batman Last Night on Earth number 3 ends their long-standing collaboration with the Dark Knight. For me personally, it also symbolizes the end of the promise DC Black Label held when it was announced. However, Last Night on Earth is a must-buy in my book. Warren Ellis's The Batman Grey Maxi series and Neil Adams' Batman vs. Ra's al Ghul miniseries continue, 
But honestly, there's not much to get excited about outside of Last Night on Earth and a Von Freeze story I'm going to cover in the special section. Joker takes a huge step back in November after the release of Warner Brothers' Joker film in October. However, DC continues pushing Harley Quinn very heavily in advance of Warner Brothers' Birds of Prey film. They release four Harley Quinn-led books, including one Year of the Villain tie-in. DC Black Label features two Harley titles, Harley No. 3, completes Step and Sidekick's prestige format series, and runs $8. Cami Garcia's Joker Harley Quinn Criminal Sanity releases the second of a nine-part series. $54 for a full Cami Garcia story is still the most ridiculous thing DC has ever tried to sell, in my opinion. Finally, Jody Hauser, a Marvel Comics import, fronts the Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy series. DC is releasing eight new Superman-related titles, including four Year of the Villain tie-ins, and that doesn't include Joshua Williamson's Batman Superman. Superman, Action Comics, Supergirl, and Supergirl Annual are all related to DC's big limelight event. Robert Venditti is writing Supergirl Annual, which is normally an insta-buy for me, but I'm personally all out on Year of the Villain. It's too bad Venditti isn't getting a chance to tell a standalone Kara Zor-El story. If Supes fans want to escape Scott Snyder's latest, biggest idea ever, they need to turn to Tom King's Superman Up in the Sky, Greg Rucka's Lois Lane, or Matt Fraction's Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. November isn't shaping up to be a banner month for readers of the world's most iconic superhero. DC Comics starts flooding Black Label with the Mississippi River's worth of mediocrity in November with 15 comics. What was until recently the coolest idea to come from the big two in years is officially a wasteland of missed opportunities and unfulfilled promise. There are a few titles that stand above the rest. Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo represent the initial promise and ultimate end of Black Label with The Last Night on Earth number 3. Jeff Lemire's The Question miniseries is being published in prestige format and runs $7 for the first of four issues. I'm considering buying Lemire's The Question and Philip Kennedy Johnson's epic fantasy comic The Last God as long as Andy Corey isn't associated with their production. Neil Gaiman's Sandman Universe, Joe Hill's Hill House Comics, and Gerard Way's Young Animal are all releasing under Black Label. It will be interesting to see if Sandman's five titles receive a sales bump after being lumped together with Curry's corrupted version of Vertigo, which ultimately killed the iconic imprint. Hill House Comics has two new offerings while Way's Young Animal releases three comics. This extremely watered-down version of Black Label feels like the biggest missed opportunity in comics since Marvel failed to capitalize on the overwhelming success of the MCU. If you want to know why comic readers can't have nice things, look no further than widespread mismanagement from Marvel's C.B. Cebulski and DC Comics' Dan Didio, Jim Lee, and Bob Harris. DC Comics is overwhelmed by Scott Snyder's latest, biggest idea of all times, You're the Villain. The publisher features no less than 23 comics spinning out of or tying into events started in the pages of Snyder's Batman Who Lulls. The event's flagship title, Batman Superman No. 4, is led by Joshua Williamson and David Marquez. Despite my personal feelings for the event, I'm pretty certain this title will be a smash hit for DC Comics. Two of the three biggest characters in all of comics headlining one series should translate to phenomenal sales. However, I don't think this event will do much for most, if any, of the ongoing titles with tie-ins to Year the Villain. DC is releasing two Year the Villain one-shots in November that I'm 99% certain will bomb exceptionally hard, despite featuring some of the best artists in the industry. Fresh off burning his Marvel bridge to embers, Cena Grace makes his DC Comics debut with the infected King Shazam No. 1. Grace borders on completely talentless as a writer. Damn, this feels like an enormous waste of Joe Bennett's exceptional talents. Another name most typically associated with Marvel, Hopeless Hallam, arrives to describe the infected Scarab No. 1 with the incomparable Freddie Williams II on art. Blue Beetle hasn't had an ongoing title or major role at DC for a while, so maybe readers have been waiting for this book. I would buy it just for the art alone if a decent writer were attached. While Hopeless isn't a great a hack like Grace, he's still nothing to get excited about either. I remain thoroughly unimpressed with anything associated with Year of the Villain. Brian Michael Bendis' event book, Event Leviathan, limps to the finish line, releasing the series finale in November. 
this title has to be considered a huge disappointment in terms of sales and customer reception. I reviewed every issue so far, and it's just really, really boring. Alex Maleev's art is also ill-suited for superhero action. Despite Event Leviathan's lackluster performance and reception, I doubt this does anything to lessen Bendis' standing or influence at DC Comics, both of which outweigh his talent and sales cachet many times over. There are several special issues releasing in November, including the comic book I'm most interested in. Sean Murphy's Curse of the White Knight takes the month off, but his first ever standalone Murphyverse title, Batman White Knight Presents Von Freeze, releases. As much as DC is heading in a multiverse of terrible directions, giving Murphy the keys to his own shared universe is brilliant. White Knight hasn't featured a dud yet, and I fully expect Von Freeze to deliver the goods with this 56-page, $6 comic book. Normally, I would be all over Tim Seeley's He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse, but it's just a definite maybe for me. To be perfectly honest, I'm really multiversed out at this point, and that goes double for the so edgy, it's beyond lame dark multiverse. Seeley is also penning Tales from the Dark Multiverse, Blackest Night, while James Tinney and the Force scribes Infinite Crisis. Both books feature excellent art teams with Kyle Holtz and Aaron Lepresti leading the way and covers from Lee Weeks. Both one-shots run $6. I couldn't be less interested despite both comics featuring artists I normally support. Five vintage reprints are scheduled for release, including four DC Dollar comics. The very famous and controversial Green Lantern 85 is releasing in facsimile edition for $4. Normally I buy these, but honestly, I grew up around a lot of drug abuse and I don't find the content that appealing. Otherwise, this would be a buy for me. DC Dollar Comics are taking a different approach from True Believers that I find less appealing. True Believers release sets of classic issues by characters and teams in conjunction with upcoming movies or title reboots. DC appears to be releasing them in chunks by creator, kinda. They're publishing reprints of Jeff John's classics Blackest Night No. 1, Flashpoint No. 1, and Infinite Crisis No. 1, as well as Brian Azzarello's Luther No. 1. I'll be scooping all these up $1 reprints are my favorite series being published by DC and Marvel at the moment. November is going to be a very light month for me for DC Comics. Besides Last Night on Earth number 3, White Knight Von Freeze, and the DC Dollar Comics, the only other floppy I'm definitely buying is Robert Venditti's Freedom Fighters number 11. I may buy the question, The Last God, or He-Man, but I'm very undecided at this point. The only other DC books I'm recommending in November are graphic novels. Absolute Swamp Thing by Alan Moore Volume 2 is an excellent addition to any home library. Moore's run on Swamp Thing is one of the greatest in industry history. Jeff John's Green Lantern Rebirth Deluxe Edition hardcover is another excellent story. Featuring art from Ethan Van Skyver and Darwin Cook, it's also one of the best illustrated comics ever. My final recommendation is Robert Menditti's Hawkman Volume 2. This trade covers the final six of 12 issues and what I personally believe is the best DC story of the past two or three years. Before I wrap up November's DC Comics solicitations, it's time to point and laugh at the worst covers they have to offer. Stephen Byrne's Wonder Twins number 9 cover is as sad and pathetic as the sales numbers. Why would anyone illustrate heroes to look this miserable? John Tim's Young Justice cover makes the list for featuring the first look at Tim Drake's very lackluster new hero uniform. And we come full circle on this video. The worst of the worst, probably in all of comics, is Jamal Campbell's Far Sector cover. Campbell is an extremely talented artist, so I imagine the contents of this book must be very poor if this is the best work it could inspire. I'm not very excited about DC Comics at the moment, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. You're the Villain is occupying far too much space in November's comic books. I'm certain Batman Superman is going to be a huge hit, but I don't see this limewide event elevating sales much, if any, for most of the tie-ins. Bringing bottom tier Marvel talent aboard to pen new Year of the Villain one-shots does little but reinforce my feelings for the event. DC Comics are quickly becoming Marvel 2.0. They're doubling their number one issues. They may very well be rebooting the Green Lantern after 12 issues with the exact same creative team. Speaking of lanterns, 
The cast of humans has grown out of control as DC fills the ranks with so much diversity it makes Axel Alonso blush. They're also releasing a litany of premium priced books in November. Cena Grace is taking the Brian Michael Bennis pipeline to DC Comics to join fellow writers G. Willow Wilson, Matt Fraction, Jody Hauser, and Kelly Sue DeConnick, among others. DC leadership are flooding their titles with untested YA authors like Cami Garcia and N.K. Jemison. I could go on, but I've made my case. DC Comics is officially trying to out-Marvel Marvel Comics, and I couldn't be more disappointed. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.